This is the Levant Mine, also nicknamed the Mine Under the Sea. It was first opened in 1820 and would eventually reach 2,000 feet deep into the earth, but also a full mile underneath the Atlantic Ocean. I'm sure you could imagine what might happen if one of those tunnels were to fail. Incredibly, that isn't even the worst of the conditions within. This is the story of the Levant Mine Disaster. As always, fewer discretion is advised. There are a lot of jobs today that are stressful for one reason or another. Some are just exhausting or emotionally draining, but the number of jobs that are truly life-threatening pales in comparison to a couple hundred years ago. While some of the improvements can be credited to new safety technology and better training, the real reason things have gotten much better is legislation. Because no matter how many injuries something might prevent, there's nothing quite like the threat of legal action to get a business to actually pay for safety equipment and mandate its use. Mining in particular has never been an easy job and still isn't. However, it's a lot better with things like electricity, forced airflow, hydraulic motors, and geological tools that can actually test how safe it is to dig somewhere. People working just a couple hundred years ago, though, didn't have access to most or all of those things. One of these mines was known as the Levant Mine and was located on the very far southwestern tip of England. It opened in 1820 and was primarily a copper mine, but also extracted tin and smaller amounts of arsenic. At the time, copper and tin were about to become very important and very lucrative since they could be used to make brass and bronze. But for the people working there, the conditions deep in the mine were nothing short of horrific. Reaching down about 600 meters or 2,000 feet below the earth, the Levant mine was pitch black, scorching hot, and parts of it stretched horizontally a whole mile underneath the Atlantic Ocean. And practically begging fate, one of the mine shafts named 40 Backs was as little as 12 meters or 40 feet from the seabed above. If that tunnel had ever failed, the mine would have filled with water too quickly for anyone on the lower levels to escape. But even without the threat of suddenly drowning quite literally looming overhead, the rest of the mine was no less forgiving. With temperatures sometimes reaching 40 degrees Celsius or over 100 Fahrenheit, many of the miners were forced to work almost naked to avoid passing out from heat stroke. Some didn't even wear work boots because they would fill with sweat, which would then put them at risk of trench foot. And all of this would have been done in total darkness, if not for one thing. Before entering the mine every day, the workers would collect a handful of clay from a pile on the surface and use it to stick a candle on top of their heads or in later decades onto their helmets. Since each man needed both hands to work, climb and use their tools, lanterns weren't a possibility and the mines were too massive to hang lights along every passage and keep them all fueled. So as strange as it looked, this was the only real way to see anything down there. Of course, this came with a whole new set of problems too. Candles would regularly blow out during work and would need to be relit so the men carried matches in waterproof brass containers. But incredibly, even that is just the start of it. Each day, hundreds of men would climb down into the mine through one of its shafts with 80 ladders between them and the bottom level. Once they were down there, they'd use hand drills to dig thin channels into the rock about a foot and a half deep to fill with gunpowder. A fuse would then be set and the tunnel would be cleared while the men waited for the explosion to shatter the next couple hundred feet worth of stone. Afterwards, they'd go back in and clear the debris with hand tools. More delicate areas, on the other hand, were done entirely using hand tools, and after the miners passed through, other teams would bring logs and wooden planks in behind them to shore up the passageway, then repeat the process all over again. All the while, hundreds of tons of stone and ore needed to be hauled kilometers back to the mine shafts every day where they could be lifted up and processed. This involved using several hundred pound minecarts pulled by horses and mules accustomed to working underground. To make things worse and even more tiring than they already sound, at the end of a full day's work, men still need to climb back up and out of the mine up the 80 flights of ladders if they were at the very bottom. This process could take a full hour and a half, not to mention the walk back to their hometowns afterward. And to add insult to injury, the possible three hours a day spent climbing ladders wasn't paid time. You were only on the clock when you actually got to your floor of the mine for one of the three eight-hour shifts each day except Sunday. All things considered, the Levant Mine certainly sounds like one of the worst jobs a person can have. But despite this, between 300 and 700 people worked at the mine most years, about two-thirds of them underground. The remainder on the surface included many women, children, and men with injuries that kept them from working down below. Their jobs were to break up the ore into fist-sized chunks with hammers and sorted by type for processing. And those who did work down below could be as young as 14 and included many people who were desperate and couldn't find work elsewhere. 
It also wasn't uncommon for exhausted men to fall from the ladders at the end of their work days. And even more injuries were caused by loose gunpowder wafting into the air and igniting on the workers' candles, blinding them or setting off premature explosions. Afterward, men who were unconscious or too injured to make the climb back up would be hauled up with ropes or later on one of these skips, which were a pair of buckets that had their own dedicated shaft for lifting stone and ore out of the mines. By 1840, engines were starting to become a little more common and began to be used in the mine, and this is how those skips were powered. Basically, these two buckets moved along vertical tracks inside of a mine shaft with a cable linking both of them over a pulley at the top. So when one went down, the other came up. This meant the steam engine powering them only needed to generate enough power to move the ore itself and not the skips since they would counterbalance one another. Then in 1857, 37 years into the mine's operation, there was another new innovation. A new system was installed for the workers to get in and out of the mine. This new system would come to be known as a man engine. A man engine was like a vertical conveyor belt or lift system with platforms for the men to stand on. It required that a thousand foot wooden rod be inserted into the mine shaft. Then, every 12 feet, there was a little wooden platform attached to this rod and a handlebar at chest height. Then at the top of this rod, at the surface, there was an engine which lifted the rod up 12 feet and then lowered it back down 12 feet. So the miners would wait for the platform to come down, step onto it, and be raised up 12 feet. Then at the highest point, they would step off onto a platform attached to the mineshaft wall. Then they'd wait for the next platform to come back down before stepping back on and repeating the process 137 more times to reach the surface from the very bottom. Now, obviously, this sounds insane, and it was, but when the alternative was to climb 80 ladders back to back, it's also easy to see why the workers were actually happy about the new machine. Compared to the hour and a half climb up the ladders, the man engine only took half an hour and was a lot safer for the exhausted miners in the long run. Though the danger of missing a step and falling was still there, it was an improvement for 1857, and even saw reduced rates of lung and heart issues and extended average lifespans for workers in mines that had them. And thanks to a series of gears, the engine was able to move the full 24-ton weight of the loaded rod with only 30 pounds of steam pressure per square inch. So regardless of how unusual it seemed, the man engine really was an improvement. On the other hand, the problem was that already by the 1850s, the first recognizable modern elevators had begun to be used. And even among similar man engines, the Levant man engine was sort of primitive. It only used one moving rod as opposed to two, which effectively doubled the time it took to reach the top or bottom because half the time was spent waiting on stationary ledges instead of stepping to a second moving rod. Additionally, it used a type of engine that could be choppy and unreliable. This was later replaced in 1893, but by then the man engine was practically ancient technology anyway. But despite this, it continued to be used for almost another 30 years. By 1919, 62 years of constant use had worn down components, rotted wood and heat and moisture of the mine shaft, and put the machine under the stress of millions of repetitions, carrying as many as 130 people at a time. Hundreds of individual parts were replaced over the years, but finally, it was too much anyway. On October 20th that year, the morning shift was winding down and miners were packing up and starting to make their way back to the surface around 3 p.m. Many of them had just survived World War I, only to return home to a struggling economy and few ways to support their families. Time and time again, those men and the workers before them had told management that the man engine wasn't safe. It was rickety and the parts shuddered as it moved. Many of the landings and steps had also been eaten away and not properly repaired, but management declined to do anything about it. Replacing the engine would cost a lot of money, and while there were plans to dig a new vertical shaft and install something a little more modern, work had yet to even begin. By then, the mine employed 331 people, with 187 of them working below ground. And as more and more people filed onto the little wooden steps, filling it nearly to capacity, just 18 inches from the top of the stroke, as most of the men were getting ready to step off, there was a bang. This was the sound of a bracket connecting the top beams to the rod that had been wearing down for five years since it was last replaced. In a single moment, it broke away and the thousand foot rod and all the men began to fall. Near the very top of the shaft, the men disappeared screaming as the only thing that they had to hold onto plummeted back into the mine shaft. As it did, it bent and buckled, breaking through the catch wings that were supposed to keep it in place. So after dropping the first 12 feet and slamming into the bottom of the mine shaft, the top 300 feet of the rod broke off and continued to fall on its own. Men farther down the engine began to realize something was happening and could hear what seemed like an avalanche of stone and wood coming down toward them. As the platform shook under their feet and started to slide, dozens of workers leapt onto the nearest ledge or the landings of different floors if they could. Others just held on for their life and found themselves sliding down level after level into the dark. 
As this happened, their candles were blown out by the sudden movement, and the shaft was filled with the crashing sounds of rock all around as the rod buckled and dug into the wall of the mine shaft, causing a partial cave-in. Then a moment later, the dust began to settle, and the rumble of stone and metal was replaced with silence for a moment. And then, with the growing cries of men trapped calling for help, many of them separated from one another and nearly all in total darkness. After the rod plummeted from the surface, the 300-foot piece that had broken off fell almost another 300 feet, shattering wooden beams and landings along the way before finally piercing the shaft wall and coming to a stop. In doing so, it had also completely blocked the tunnel by taking out so many of the sports. Then, down below, the rest of the rod had buckled but mostly remained in place, trapping the men on it deep underground. Back at the top of the mine, workers knew something had gone wrong, but not what or how bad it was. One of the few dozen workers who had just made it to the top when the break happened, a man named John Grenfell, volunteered to climb back down into the shaft and see what had happened. And almost immediately, he came across a group of dead and injured who were twisted between the wooden beams and rocks that completely sealed the tunnel. Horrifyingly, John's father was one of the site managers and he was one of the missing somewhere down below. Following the disaster, the emergency call went out as fast as people could carry it. Few, if any, places in that part of England had telephones at the time, but as word spread, off-duty miners came in droves from nearby towns. And hundreds more from neighboring mines like the Giver Mine and the Eastpool Mine would also come to help. Friends, family, reporters, and others all arrived with them on the first day and then later. Once the rescue was underway, trying to save as many as they could was grueling work. Because the shaft had been so badly damaged, every rescuer had to be winched down into it on a rope. There, they would tie ropes around each and every piece of debris, lifting it up and out of the way while trying not to destabilize the shaft or cause more to fall. All of the stone and wood that could weigh hundreds of pounds need to be pulled up to clear the way to the survivors, and this would go on for days on end. And obviously, those trapped down below had their own challenges. After relighting their candles, if they still had them, over a hundred men did their best to regroup. Many still had emergency ladders on their levels, which hadn't been knocked out, and were able to move around still, but there wasn't any chance of going up. Instead, they gathered everyone they could and helped the injured walk to the skip shaft and the water pumping shaft. Each of these was also equipped with emergency ladders and went the full distance to the surface. So two hours after the collapse, to the shock and relief of the rescuers, men from the bottom of the shafts began appearing out of the engine rooms and ore processing building. Then, incredibly, as exhausted as they were from a full day's work and then an unexpected climb, nearly all of them joined the rescue effort. Still by then, over 50 of their friends and co-workers were missing somewhere down below. In the end, it would take three whole days of digging, winching, and crawling through partially clapped tunnels to rescue all the survivors. But the process was slow, and on many occasions, they weren't able to reach those calling for help before they fell silent. Among the dead, sadly, was John's father. The Levant Mine and its workers all came from small towns and villages. Everyone knew everyone there, and each death was a friend or family member. Over the course of three days of constant rescue effort, the death toll rose to 31. 14 were found near the top of the pile at about 150 feet deep. Most of the rest were between 160 and 320 feet, and the final three were found at 420 feet, 480 feet, and 660 feet deep. These three were all as a result of being struck by falling debris. Among these tragedies were also many survivors. A boy named William Lowry, who was only 14 years old, spent 15 hours trapped beneath the body of another miner near the top of the pile before being rescued. He was actually the first to be pulled out and had a snapped collarbone, eight broken ribs, and needed 36 stitches to his face and head, but would later make a full recovery. Another man named Nicholas Thomas held on for a whole 50 hours, only to pass away from exhaustion after he was rescued on the way up to the surface. Tragically, five of the men killed had survived the First World War to get there, and nearly everyone in the county knew someone who died. This was devastating for the local communities. In addition to those who passed away, 19 miners suffered serious injuries of some kind, and not all of them were physical. A miner named Ralph Ellis was a veteran of World War I, whose foster father was among those who was killed in the disaster. The next year, 1920, Ralph was one of the first to arrive at another mine accident, which resulted in the deaths of four others. This was the final straw for Ralph, and afterward he suffered a break and was never the same. An investigation following the collapse found that the bracket at the top of the rod, which had broken, was improperly made. The metal had internal faults, and that led to the controversial decision to label the event an accident. This removed all liability from the owners, despite the fact that no other mine in all of Cornwall was still using a managed except the Levant. All of the rest had moved over to more modern, safer systems. 
This then left the families involved without any financial compensation, and many were forced to move out as they became unable to afford the rent of their houses. To try and offset things, a disaster fund was set up and people throughout the entire county contributed, hoping to raise 15,000 pounds. The mines insurance company even paid out without the owners being found criminally responsible, and support and donations poured in from officials, news organizations, and local businesses. An anonymous author even wrote a poem about the disaster, sold for two pence each to contribute to the fund. But it could only stretch so far, and obviously couldn't bring anyone back. The mine itself continued for a few years until 1930, but it was a shadow of its former self. The price of tin in the post-war economy and then the 1930s depression made it impossible for the man engine to be replaced with a more modern system. In 1967, the mine's beam engine came into the care of the National Trust, which is a conservation agency and was maintained as a historical piece. Other parts of the mine have been gradually rebuilt on the surface or brought back into working condition as historical pieces. The Levant mine remains open to the public to this day, but the underground portion is firmly sealed shut. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. If you have a store suggestion, feel free to submit it to the form found in the description. And hopefully, I will see you in the next one.